Awesome sort of put it to me once. Uh, with you people, it's all about Jesus, and in Islam, it's all about us. And you know, we've got to make it work for ourselves. But you just think that Jesus can do it all for you. And of course, as we know, if Jesus didn't do it for us, not much hope that we're going to be able to do it for ourselves. My talk is following on from Andreas. Why Muslim evangelism? Why should we do it? Uh, I've had people say to me, Christian people, my best friend, his wife once said to me, you know, these people, they've, uh, they've got their own religion, they reject Christianity, why don't you just leave them alone and let them go their own way? Even my parents took that attitude towards me. My father and them used to say, you know, <clears throat> they, they're good people, they've got a, their own religion, and why don't you just leave them to it? You know, why are you wanting to disturb them? If you start bringing Muslims to the Christian faith, you're just going to cause the breakup of homes and things. You know, that's not a good thing. Why don't you just leave them alone? Well, the point is, and as you've heard from Andreas this morning, if we leave them alone to do it their way, they're not going to get there. That's the whole thing. And it is our duty and it is incumbent on us to reach Muslims of the gospel. One of the favorite objections that I have heard is this. There don't seem to be many results. Why put so much work and effort into a ministry that's not going to produce results? Uh, most Muslims are strongly opposed to the Christian faith, even those who are not, um, and nonetheless have no wish or desire to become Christians. When people ask me in earlier years, I remember ministering here in what was the old Transvaal, for 17 years from home to home to Muslims, we covered every area, a group of us, just come out here to Zadville in Krugersdorp, we go to Lanasia, Laudium, all over, you know, even into the smaller towns like Ermelo, Bethel, everywhere, reaching Muslims of the gospel. And, I, and we reached, with the exception of Lanasia, it was just too big, but we reached every Muslim home in the Transvaal over a period of 17 years, with the exception of some Lanasia homes, it was just too much. And people said to me, how many people do you know who have come to faith? How many Muslims in those 17 years have come to faith in Jesus and become Christians? And my answer was four. <laughs> four. <laughs> and they said, all that work just to see four Muslims become Christians. I said, what a wasted effort. You know, you, we, you know even when I was in full-time ministry down in Durban, more than one of the people of that church said to us, you know, I don't know why you bother with these people. We, you know, we could use you so much in our church. You know, we'd like you to come in there. Why do you have to waste your time going to people who don't want to listen to you anyway? <laughs> well, don't think I didn't ask myself that question about a thousand times. <laughs> in all those years, I was grateful for one thing at that time, that I was not in full-time ministry. I was in, I'm a lawyer, I'm an attorney. And I uh, was admitted in 1974, been practicing in Benoni as an attorney for most of my life, I'm still doing so even though I'm turning 74 next month. And the, why I say that was a good thing was because firstly I didn't have to prove myself. One of the difficulties missionaries have who are being supported to do Muslim evangelism is to justify what they are doing because the question invariably comes, what results are you getting? How many people are becoming Christian believers? Is it worth it? Why are, you, you know, why are people putting so much into your ministry when it's not delivering? Fortunately, we didn't have to answer that question to anybody because I was self-supporting. And the people who were with me were self-supporting. We were all on our own. One thing we showed is that you don't have to be in full-time ministry to effectively reach Muslims with the gospel. All of you can do it. We did it. We did it for years. In fact, since I came back from Durban in uh, 1991, we got back into ministry here in Lanasia and in Actonville in Benoni. So, and even today, I'm still finding myself in different forms of Muslim outreach. And to me, the question of converts was not the issue. What to me was the issue was the quality of the conversions we were seeing. 
and I'm going to start with the first one. My friend Ben Plantinga, he is from Benoni, he lives today about 200 yards away from me. He stood by me for 17 years. We put Muslim evangelism first. We annoyed our families. We annoyed his wife, fortunately not mine. And we annoyed a whole lot of people because it was the absolute priority. We said no wedding, no birthday celebration, no anniversary, nothing comes before the ministry we're in. We're out on these nights of the week. We're going on weekends. We're going further afield for whole weekends. Every Easter weekend, we are going out around up north. One Easter weekend, we went to Polakwani. We went to that part of the world, spent the whole weekend up there. And we said, we are not prepared to compromise. We're going to put Muslim evangelism first. That's the only way we're going to stick it out. And I was right, because we found other people came and went, came and went. They'd worked with you for about a year, and then they'd give up. And virtually everybody did that. We never had more than about five of us. But Ben and I just had this fixed conviction. We're going to do it and we're not going to stop. <clears throat> well, we went up one weekend, Ben, myself and my wife, to what was then Nilestrom. I can never remember the names. Not Mukapong, it's something else now. I can't remember the name. But anyway, up there, <clears throat> there were about 20 Muslim homes. Not many of them. <clears throat> but one of the great advantages we had in those days and it's the only good thing I can ever say for apartheid, was that we knew where to find the Muslims, because under the apartheid rule, <coughs> all the Indian people were made to live in Indian areas. You know that. That's how Lanasia and all these areas started. <coughs> but it made it easy for us, because we knew in every town where to find the Muslims. So I would, we went up to... Uh, I did once. I remember I went on, on a public holiday. I left my home at about 1 o'clock in the morning, and drove all the way up to what was then Louis Trichard. And I got there and I went to the Indian area and mapped it out. And then I went down to Petersburg, now Polakwani, and I mapped out the whole Indian area there. And then warm baths, Nailstrom, and so on. And Port Kitas Rust. And in one morning, and I got back by lunchtime and went to have with my wife to go and see my parents in the afternoon. They had no idea where I'd been from one o'clock in the morning. But when we did that, it was because we knew exactly where to find the Muslims. And that was an opportunity because, because they made no attempt to stop us either. Nowhere else in the world today that you can do that. You can't do that in South Africa today. It's virtually impossible. It was just something, just a phenomenon that was created for about 20 years that we were able to seize the opportunity and get to Muslim homes all the time. Well, at Nilestrom, we, we arrived there, I think, on a Friday afternoon. We went out that evening. We visited two homes. And then we, next morning, we went around the area and the afternoon and the evening. And on Sunday, we went again. And what we found in most of those small towns was that there was often one dominant Muslim family. It would be the... Uh, in Fentersdorp, we found one. In uh, Nailstrom, we would find another. And uh, as we did we'd find that we were virtually meeting the whole extended family. They were living in the whole place. So the word shot around quickly that we were there and telling them what we were doing. And they weren't very happy with us. And as we had finished just the last time Sunday morning, um, um, a Muslim guy came down the street. We'd seen him two nights ago. And he said, come on, people, it's enough of this now. It's time for you to go home. So... <laughs> So I said to them, I think he's right. I said, we've done what we can, and that was it. But when we got home, I said to Ben, look, we were planning to be there for the whole weekend, only come back this evening. We didn't expect to get through it so quickly. So I said, uh, do you want to come out with me to Actonville this afternoon, or would you rather go home? And he said, no, I'll come with you. We'll go and see. So we went to Actonville, knocked on a door, Muslim people, no, I don't really want to chat to you. Knocked on another door, nobody home. Knocked on the third door, and this time a whole lot of people there. And it was a group of them, about 15 of them, Hindus, Muslims, what have you, children, parents, kids running around. No, you're welcome to come in. We're all just having a chat. Come and talk to us. So we went in and we sat down. We had about eight to ten of us sitting around the table. Hindus, Muslims, myself and Ben. 
And about halfway through our talk, we were there for about two to three hours, about halfway through, there's a woman sitting on the right-hand side of me, I guess she was about my age, about 26 at the time. And she turned to me and she said, listen, she said, I don't believe a word you say. She said, we don't believe that you must fear God. You know, I don't believe I must fear God. Why should I fear God? She said, I believe in God and I pray to God, but I don't see why I should fear him. And I thought, strange language, but I guess this woman is a Muslim. So I said to her, what are you? Are you, are you a Muslim? She said, oh yes, now I'm a born Muslim. Yes, I'm a Muslim. And I believe in Allah and follow the religion of Islam. But I do not believe what you're telling me, that we must live in fear of God. So I thought, oh, well, don't bother about her. So we went on. Anyway, another hour and a half of talking. Eventually, people started standing up, getting ready to go. Ben and I knew our time was up. And as they started getting up and chatting to each other, I hadn't got up yet, and she turned to me. And she said to me, may I ask you a question? And I said to her, yes, sure, go ahead. She said, how do you receive the Holy Spirit? <laughs> now, I tell you, you don't hear that question from Muslims. I don't recall ever hearing another Muslim ask me that question. How do you receive the Holy Spirit? And I looked at her and I said, well, look, I said, you're a Muslim, aren't you? She said, yes. I said, well, I can't make this easy for you. I said, you're going to have to give your life to Jesus Christ. You're going to have to become a committed Christian and give him everything you've got. All or nothing. I saw her just bite her bottom lip, just bit it tightly. And I said to her, if you don't mind, I said, I think you are serious. This is going on while everybody else is just chatting and moving around, just the two of us talking. I said, I think you're serious. She said, I'm very serious. She said, I want to receive the Holy Spirit. I want to get right with God. So I said, well, do you mind if we come and visit you? No, please do. Her name was Amina at the name of the Prophet Muhammad's mother. And 10 days later, we went to visit her. And we sat down with her and spoke to her for quite a while and seemed to get on well with her. And then we said, can we come and see you again? Yeah. So the next week we went back. And while we were sitting there, I got to a point where I felt I can't say much more. And she seems to be receptive. And I said, are you ready to give your life to the Lord Jesus? She said, definitely. She said, I'm convinced this is the truth, and I'm going to give my life to him. So we were thrilled. That was the first Muslim we saw come to faith in Jesus. Well, I want to tell you, I saw Mina last week, as we know her as Mina. My wife and I went to see her. Shame she lost her husband recently. She lives in Benoni. She lives a kilometer from me. Been there for 50 years now. She, almost she's been a Christian believer. And what a wonderful Christian believer. It's the quality of the converts that we've seen. That to me has been quite something. She phones me up every now and again. Says to me recently when it was Ramadan, you know my family. She said, every year it's the same old thing. She says, they say nothing to me in the year. She's got a lot of brothers and sisters, about eight of them. She says, and then comes Ramadan and, and Eid. And she says, and then they start. She says, Mina, it's time for you to come back to Islam. Christianity, she said to me this time. My sister says to me, Christianity is nothing got nothing to offer. She said, I'm, near, I'm 72 years of age. I mean, what do they think I want to do? She said, 50 years I've been a believer in Jesus and I've followed him faithfully. What makes them think I'm going to give, give him up now? And I tell you, it's, it's just so encouraging to see that. And I remember some years ago, I'm giving you a lot of testimonies because I want to encourage you. I'm going to hear mainly testimonies here in my talk. Oh, about 1998, I think it was, about 20 years ago. Um, I was sitting in my office one morning, Tony and Benoni, and the phone rings. So I pick up the phone and I say, hello, and this is what I hear. Hello, Miss Gilchrist. So I said, yes. Uh, Me waza. I said, sorry, I can't hear you. Me waza. I said, all right. I come see you. So I said, all right, what's it about? I thought there's some legal problem. No, I come see you. I said, all right. He says, I come. I know you, Woburn Avenue. I know you there. I live in Woburn Avenue, so I'll come see you. So I said, all right, whoever you are, if you want to, whatever, by all means. About a week later, my receptionist buzzes me. 
And she says, there's a guy here called Waza or something who wants to see you. Uh, so I said, well, I know who it is. I said, send him in. As I'm sitting there, this young guy about 27, 28 years of age, wearing a nice jacket, nice clean looking youngster, comes into my office, looks over the table at me and says, Mr. Gilchrist, my name is Waza. I am an Algerian Christian. <laughs> I nearly fell over backward. I mean, Alger I tell you, Algeria is one of the most toughest Muslim countries in the world to try and evangelize. And I said, well, tell me what happened. I said, you're obviously born a Muslim. Oh, yeah. He said, I just read in the Quran a lot of things about Jesus, and I got interested in it. But it didn't tell me enough. So I then saw the Quran says, if there's anything you want to know about Christians, ask the Jews and the Christians about you know, about anything we've taught you, ask the Jews and the Christians before you. And it talked about the scripture, the Injil, you know, the gospel. So I got myself a Bible. He said, and I started to read the thing and didn't take long. And I knew this is the truth. I mean, he wasn't, he couldn't speak English as freely as I'm speaking it to you. In broken English, this was the story I got. And in the end, he said, I gave my life to Jesus, but I couldn't continue forever living in Algeria. It was getting too hot. So I've come here to South Africa. Well, I was just thrilled. And around that time, Amina's mother died. And as usual, you know, Satan waits for an opportune time, as the scripture says. And the family comes to her. Amina, you know what? Your poor mother, you know, we, she had nine children. And we've all been faithful Muslims except you. And she's lying in the tomb there. And Munkar and Nakir, the two angels, are, are sitting on her shoulder. And they are persecuting her. They are putting pins into her. They are throwing things at her. All because her daughter committed apostasy and became a murtad. Went over and became a Christian. And this hit Amina hard. And it's the only time I've ever seen her flinch. And she said to me, she said, John, is it not possible to be a Christian and a Muslim at the same time? <laughs> Some Christians actually think it is. I won't talk about them. So I said, no. I said, I told you the day I met you, 100% commitment to the Lord Jesus. I didn't quite know how to reach her. I was going through a difficult period myself. So I then thought, maybe I should get Waza to come along. I'd had another experience with Waza. I used to go from my office in those days. I wouldn't do it today. Things have changed. But I used to go right across the center of town, through the plaza, to the post office, to get my post and walk back, just to get a break from work for half an hour. And one morning I did that. I walked across. And as I came to the plaza area, I see Waza. And he jumps up and he comes to me and he's all excited. And he's sitting talking to two guys that I could see are Muslims, but couldn't tell you where they were from. And he said, Mr. Gilchrist, he said, I'm so pleased to see you. He says, you know, just as you come here and you meet with me, you won't believe it. These two Muslim guys, they are from Algeria as well. They are Algerian Muslims. And I am sharing the gospel with them as you talk to me. You know, I've gone into Benoni churches and I've said to them, is this what it takes to evangelize Muslims in this town? That God has got to send Algerian Christians from Algeria to come and reach Algerian Muslims in the center of Benoni. <laughs> so what's the matter with you that you don't reach them? That really thrilled me. So anyway, I got the idea. I thought, let me get hold of Waza and let me take him. So I phoned up Amina and I said, can I bring somebody to meet you and talk to you. He's a Muslim convert as well. She said, all right, no, that's fine, I'm prepared to listen. So I went out to her business where she was working in Apex in Benoni, and we came in, I introduced Waza to her, and I just sat back, I never said a word. And I left it to Waza to do all the talking to her. And I can tell you, it wasn't very good English, but it was very good truth, very good evangelism. And he just told her what it had cost him to become a Christian believer. And I sat there just fascinating watching this Algerian Muslim convert, you know, witnessing to and sharing the gospel again with this Indian Muslim convert. 
And I can assure you, Mina has never flinched from that day. Amen. This is what makes it all worthwhile. I said to my friend Ben that day, I said to him when we came home and she'd committed her life to Jesus and she'd been baptized in the church, in North Mid Baptist Church in Benoni. And I said to him, we've worked here for three and a half years among Muslims and we have met one Muslim who's been followed our message and has given her life to Jesus. I said, what if we work for another 35 years and never see another Muslim convert? Do you think it's worth it for the one? I said, if we believe what the Bible tells you, that if one person, one sinner, commits their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, all that person's sins will be forgiven. They will be glorified to share eternal glory with Jesus forever. I said, we don't even have to, we don't spend all day, every day witnessing to Muslims. What's 35 years in comparison to eternity? I said, the reward of our ministry is out of all proportion already to any effort that we can put into it. And that's what it is. Muslims themselves, though, find it very difficult to become Christians. The reason is this, firstly a word I used, murtad, Arabic word for a apostate. All over the world, Muslims who become Christians have lost their lives. I've seen on the internet tragedies, atrocities. One of a young Turkish Christian guy, very nice looking guy, and, they, they, and the Muslims put on this, this sequence of um, photographs of a, a mulana, grossly overweight, completely obese, with his beard, black everything, black beard, black, black shirt, looked like the devil himself. <laughs> but he had a sword in his hand, a very, very fine sword. And they made him bend over, and in the film, they just sliced his head off in one go. They took his head and his body, they attached it to a fence, just wired it up in the middle of a street, head above the body, and they said, this is what will happen to any Muslim who becomes a Christian in this country. That's why it is so difficult. They find the rejection of their own people, they find the persecution that they might find coming their way very, very hard to handle. The other thing is family ties. Family ties among Muslims are very, very strong, as I'm sure you all know. For a Muslim to give her or his life to Jesus Christ is regarded by the family as a total rejection of the family itself. And the families will turn against them to the point of even killing them if necessary, because they are dishonoring the family by becoming Christians. Also because... They belong to the Muslim community. And in Muslim lands, to give yourself to the Lord Jesus, you're out on your own. You are vulnerable. The whole community, the Ummah around you is Muslim. And they will reject you as well. And then again, most Muslims do think and genuinely think that Islam is the true religion. But what they miss and what Andreas was saying and what I'll just add to is that Islam doesn't understand the meaning of the word life, eternal life, spiritual life, the spirit of God. They're, they're, these things mean nothing to Muslims. Ismail Buller was a Muslim from the Muslim youth movement in Benoni who about 50 years ago wrote a booklet called Islam, the Natural Religion of Man. And when I looked at that, I said to myself, now that's the hold on problem. Because the truth is Christianity the spiritual religion of God. That's the whole difference. And that's what they miss. They don't understand that. I've said so many Muslims just recently have said to me, but Islam is so obviously the natural religion. The religion. It just makes so much natural sense. The way we dress, the way we worship, our pilgrimages, our fasting and everything. You know, Christianity, one man is God. Oh, you know, sorry, it doesn't make sense. Formal monotheism, and they are soaked in it, and they do not know the knowledge of God. They think Islam has all the answers, and in a way, it has the answers, but they are the wrong answers every time. For example, what is the heart of Christian faith? 
one thing, the person of Jesus. Everything focuses on him. Most of us are not even aware in the New Testament of how deliberately everything in the New Testament does not focus on anything religious. It focuses on discipleship to a person. But Islam closes that gap. Muhammad, prophet of Islam, he is the seal of the prophets. He is the one we, we follow. And I can tell you, even though they say to you, Muhammad was a prophet of Allah just like all the others. They don't really believe that. Muhammad is the supreme personality who for the Muslims replaces Jesus as the, as the personality that you should follow. Secondly, we have our Holy Bible. Remember in Nazadville one evening, a friend of mine who was with me was witnessing to a Muslim lady. And when she finished, this Muslim lady said to us, well, you know, very nice what you say, and now we talk about Christianity. She said, but, you know, in our religion, we have the same as you. Everything is the same. You see, you've got your uh, Sunday prayers. You go on Sunday to, to worship. We've got our Friday prayers. We go on Fridays, and so on. You've got your Holy Bible. We've got our Holy Quran. You know, you've got this. We've got the same. It's just a different color. I'm, I've got a film on Jerusalem a lovely moment at the end of it where it goes from Jews to Christians to Muslims and how they fight with each other and they fight against each other and it goes on and on it's a comical film by the end of it there's a Muslim guy sitting there just on his chair stroking his beard with, with it written all over his face been there done that seen it all and he just comments casually he says you know there are only three big businesses in Jerusalem one collects money on Fridays, the second one collects money on Saturdays, and the third one collects money on Sundays. <laughs> but you, you see, that unfortunately, there's an element of truth in that, that they don't see Christianity as being any different to Islam. It's, the, 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 it's closed. Holy Bible, Holy Quran. You've got your focal point. If you're a Catholic, it's, the, uh, you know, it's in Rome. If you're a, someone else, it might be Jerusalem. No, we've got ours. We've got the holy city of Mecca. We've got the Kaaba. We've got everything. Everything you've got, we've got. That's one of the things that makes it so difficult for them to come to faith in Jesus. But just to tell you a few other stories. Many, many years ago, I was living in Durban with my wife and children. I'd moved into full-time ministry. And I was convinced, I'd been convinced for five years that the Lord had set me aside to go and minister for the remaining years of my life in Natal. We'd done the work in the Transvaal, now we go to Natal. And I don't want to go to detail, but absolutely everything went wrong. I think the Lord, in his own way, made it plain to me, I've not called you here. Even Andreas came from Cape Town. For about four days just to come and be with me he just knew that I was going through a very good difficult time and he was a real comfort to me when he did but at the time I went through depression five months of it and the worst week of it was the very first one I'd had a dream one night I won't tell you what it was silly dream but it woke me up the next morning it just brought me face to face with reality and I realized it wasn't going to make it in Durban every I mean, I thought, I'm here 20 years ahead of my time. I can tell you today, I think it's at least 30, because it's 30 years since I left there. And I can tell you, there's no part of South Africa where Christians are less interested in Muslim evangelism than in Durban. Anyway, on that, in that week, the worst day of that week was the Thursday. About Tuesday, I fell into depression and went down and down. And I remember that Thursday, and I had to go out that evening to visit a Muslim called Ismail. He was a car guard at our church, and he said I could come and visit him. And I went, and of course, you know, when you're depressed, everything goes wrong. Pouring with rain, I've just had a gout attack, so <laughs> everything's going against me. I get to Chatsworth, and I go up the stairs in the rain, and knock on the door, and Ismail opens the door, and he says, no, you're welcome, come in. But within five minutes, he disappears. And he leaves me to the Muslim family there to tear me apart for two hours, which is what they did. They just had such an antagonism to Christianity. 
And they started off, and they, all their frustrations, whatever it was that had upset them, they just took out on me and went and gunned for me. And there were at least 10 people in the lounge, all of them Muslims. And I tried to soften the blow. I thought, you know, let me try and just get, get away from, you know, Christianity and Islam. So I started telling them, I just want to show you something. I started telling them that I was doing a research. I could see from the pictures of the Mazars and the Dargahs of Islam on the, all the saints' tombs on the wall. I knew these were saint-worshipping Muslims. There's one in five Indian Muslims in this country that follows this movement. And so I said, well, look, I'm, while I'm here, I'm doing research into this, and I'm planning to write a book on it, which seven years later, Andreas and I had together published, and that's this book that's available here today, Sufi Muslim Saints of India and South Africa. And while I was talking, there were two young girls there, I'd say about 12 years of age, just daughters, and one of them just got up and walked out. And I thought, okay, she doesn't want to listen to me, that's okay. But a minute later, she came back, and she had a page, two pages, just, just like this, just, just two A4 pages, and it was photocopies of an article about Sufi Sahib. And she said, I don't know if this will help you, but it's an article about Sufi Sahib. And to get any information was hard. So I said, well, that's very kind of you. I appreciate it. Anyway, I went home back to Durban North that evening, as down in the dumps as I ever could be. Four years later, I was invited to do like here this morning, handle a seminar on Muslim evangelism at the Full Gospel Church in Musgrave. And we had about 60 people there that morning, half were white and half were Indian, about the general split in Durban. And it went very well, 60 people there, and at tea time at the end of it, I was just at the back like here and I was just having a cup of tea. And two Indian girls about 17 years of age came up to me and just started chatting. And as they chatted, I asked the one, I said, what's your name, by the way? And I think, I can't remember, but it was something like Carol. And I said, oh, but that's a Christian name. I said, uh, my guess is you weren't born into a Hindu family. No, you're quite right. She said, I was born into a Catholic family. She said, but I've given my life to the Lord Jesus, and I'm committed to him, and I'm a fully-fledged evangelical believer. I said, well, that's fantastic. So I turned to the other one, and I said, what's your name? And she said, Sumaya. So I looked at her and I said, hang on a minute. I said, that's a Muslim name. She said, yes. I said, uh, were you born a Muslim? She said, yes. I said, uh, and now, are you a Christian? Oh, yes. She said, I'm, I love the Lord Jesus. She said, I've been baptized, belong to a church. I am completely committed to Jesus. I tell you, this was 30 years ago in the days when... Converts were very few and far between. There are a lot more today. We estimate about 3,000 Muslim converts in South Africa today. But in those days, you could put them on two hands. So I just said to her, well, that's really encouraging. I said, you don't know what it means to me to meet a Muslim convert like yourself. And then she looked at me and she said, you don't recognize me. So I said, why? No, I don't. I said, do I know you? She said, oh, you know me. She said, you came to my home in Chatsworth one evening and I gave you that article on Sufi Sahib. And shortly after that, I gave my life to the Lord Jesus. <laughs> Tell you, folk, it's worth it. Just something like that makes it so worth it. And not many Muslims are coming to faith in Jesus. But I heard just the other day, we, we saw a woman, I didn't even have anything to do with this one's conversion. We, had four, we saw four converts in 17 years and I had nothing to do with Halima's conversion. Other folk with me did all the witnessing to her and so on and she committed her life to Christ. And recently, uh, somebody in Benoni who'd been in ministry with us at the time, this is now 30 years later, said to me, oh, I, do you remember Halima? I said, yes, well, well, I think you should know. He said, I, she said, I bumped into her the other day and she's totally committed to the Lord. She serves him with all her heart. I just thought you should know. You know, I had a letter some years ago 
It's come on my email address and came from a Muslim guy. I don't know from where, no idea. Can't even remember his name. But he said, uh, he said, I'm just sending you a letter to encourage you. He said, I want you to know I was a Muslim and I'm a now a Christian believer and I was converted on your literature alone. Yeah. You know, you, you just don't know what the Lord's doing with you. The hard work over many years of, of slaving while you're just sowing, in this case, seed on concrete. You know, not even on hard ground. We were sowing the seed of the gospel on concrete. But the lovely thing about concrete is it tends to crack here and there. And if there's any seed underneath it, it'll pop up. And this is what's been happening. I know that the Lord Jesus is not going to return to this earth until the whole Muslim world has been evangelized. It's not going to happen. And I'll tell you why. Because Jesus said that himself. He said, this gospel will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. The all nations includes Libya, it includes Algeria, it includes Chad, it includes Saudi Arabia, all those Muslim countries. They've got, there's got to be a breakthrough. Only when the Spirit of God has broken through to every one of those countries, one way or another, will Jesus return. Jesus said, Matthew 28, 19, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, to all nations. Go and pro proclaim the gospel to all nations, every one of them. John says in the book of Revelation 7, verse 9, he said, I saw a great multitude, which no man could number, from every nation, all tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne of God and of the Lamb. Every nation, all tribes, all peoples. So many people are saying to us, you know, we don't see the point of evangelizing Muslims. Well, I'm sure they're still hoping the Lord Jesus will return. But if we don't evangelize them, he won't. Not until we do. And it's, he never said we have to convert all of them. He said just as a testimony to all nations will be sufficient. Phew, let me finish. In 1987, I went to a conference in Zeist in Holland, been invited there, and just about everybody who was anything in Muslim evangelism was invited. There were about 50 of us there. And on the last night that I was there, there was a missionary there from Afghanistan called Dr. Christy Wilson, Jr. His father had gone as probably the first missionary to Afghanistan some years earlier, and he'd been there for quite a while. In those days, there was a church built, a, a Protestant church, the first one in Kabul, the only one ever built, about 1967, under pressure. The Afghans, under pressure from President Eisenhower, agreed to allow a church to be built. But they said, but not for Muslims in Afghanistan to go there. That church may only be attended to by foreigners. So, um, but the church was built. In 1974, when the communists took over in Afghanistan, they destroyed that church. To my knowledge, there's no Protestant church building anywhere in Afghanistan today. But Dr. Christy Wilton called up a friend of his there at this meeting we were at at Zeiss that evening. It was the last night there, and he called up a guy called Paul, and he said, come to the front. And he said, you know, I love my brother here. He says, this man means so much to me. You know why? He said, because on this Easter Sunday night in 1972, he said, I was preaching in that church. And he came in, and he was a totally godless man. He didn't care for religion. He only came to get a bit of fellowship with fellow Europeans. But he said, but he heard me preach, and he gave his life to the Lord Jesus that night. He said, and now he's in Muslim outreach, and I'm so proud to have him here today. Well, I'm sitting flabbergasted, because I was converted on Easter Sunday night, April the 2nd, 6.30 in the evening. And I thought, you know, he and I have called each other twin brothers ever since. <laughs> he's, he's been running a ministry in Colorado, but we both came to know the Lord the same night. But what fascinated me was that Dr. Christy Wilson was so excited because even if no Muslim had come to faith in Jesus, at least a German had done so. <laughs> 
least the Holy Spirit could work in Afghanistan. That was very interesting. He said then, he said that night when he was there, 1987, he said, we know of only 10 Afghan converts in the world, and every one of them lives outside Afghanistan. We know of no Afghan believer anywhere in Afghanistan. Would you believe when he came here to South Africa, three years later, he told a very different story. He said, you know, we have found that there are communities of Christians, believers in Afghanistan. 30 here, 50 there. He said, not only are Afghans who are out of Afghanistan coming to Christ, they are coming to Christ in Afghanistan. The Church of God is establishing itself there. How on earth do you think that happened in such a short period of time? Can you imagine? Anybody got a guess? You won't believe it. You know what caused it? The Soviet Union, when it started breaking up, ended up in that war in Afghanistan. And they didn't want to go there. Nobody wants to go to Afghanistan. I know a missionary who said that she would prayed to the Lord and said, out of commitment to you, you can send me to the worst place on earth. And she said, he sure did. He sent me to Afghanistan. <laughs> well, the Russians didn't want to go there. They didn't want to send their best troops there. So they decided to collect all the misfits, because that was under communist rule. So all the non-communists, all the gypsies, the Christians, the Jehovah's Witnesses, anybody who wasn't a committed communist. So they sent a disproportionate number of Christian soldiers into Afghanistan. And they didn't go there to do that much of the fighting. The main thing was to strengthen the Afghan government, which was communist, and help them to do the fighting. So these people, when they got there, these Christians, they started meeting Afghans. They started caring for them and started looking after them. And slowly but surely, the communities of Christian believers started up. I bet you not one of you came near to guessing how that had happened. <laughs> I stood dumbfounded when I read that. I said, so that's how the Lord gets a church going in Afghanistan. They'd said years earlier, we can send radio messages into the country, but that's all. You can't even get missionaries into the country. Instead, the Lord sends his missionaries, Soviet Union military uniforms, AK-47 over this shoulder, hammer and sickle here, and they go in there as God's missionaries, disguised as Soviet soldiers, and they go and share the gospel. I could go on, but I think I should stop there. Just to encourage you, folk, I can tell you one thing about evangelism. Every witness, every prayer, every fasting counts. I don't know how, but the Lord will show it. One way or another, every sing of them counts. So when you meet a Muslim and you want to share the gospel with them, even though they may brush you off, you never know. We know of converts who've come and spoken about how somebody spoke to them years earlier and, and it led up later to their conversion. I just want to close you and tell you about my books here this morning. Um, I've got six uh, that are all here. This one I've shown you, Sufi Muslim Saints of India and South Africa. This book's not that popular, but to me it's important because most Muslims are very orthodox, and orthodox Islam is very monotheistic. These people who follow this movement, I took this photograph in India. This is the great Saint Kharib Nawaz in India. Every one of these saint worshippers knows who Kharib Nawaz is, Kwajamunidin Chishti. He's buried under that dome. And many of them here tell me, Muslims, we want to go on pilgrimage. First, we're going to go to Ajmer in India, to the tomb of Kharib Nawaz, and then we'll go to Makkah and Medina. And I always say, when the Muslims say, we're going to India first, it means that these people, their saints, seem to be more important than their prophet. And that's why it's so essential for Christians to know. I can tell in any Muslim home I walk into, I just have to look around on the walls, and I know whether they are Orthodox Muslims or whether they follow the saint movement. Because they've got the saint movement followers have got all these pictures of the Darkas, that's the holy shrines, like this one in, in Ajmer. 
This is an important book, put a lot of work into it. Second one is the Quran and the Historical Jesus. In this book, I've got a lot of new stuff that's not been there before to show how, firstly, the Quran overrates Jesus in terms of Islamic religion. It tells you that that means verily the Messiah, the son of Mary, is nothing but a messenger. That's the dogma. But then it tells you that Jesus was born of a virgin woman. Oh, yes. He almost repeats Luke's gospel in describing that. Oh, yes, in the end of his life, he was taken up to heaven. He didn't die, according to Muslims. So his life ended supernaturally, just like it started. Then on top of that, the Quran calls him a word from him. Kalima uh, minhu, word from him. Or a ruhun minhu, spirit from him. So Jesus is a spirit from God. That's what it says. He is a word from God. He is al-Masihu Isa, the Messiah, which means that he is the only one in the Quran who gets a title. Not even Muhammad has a title in the Quran. But Jesus has got this title 11 times, al-Masihu Isa, the Messiah Jesus. And I had a debate some years ago at the Johannesburg University with... Um, it was Dr. James White and I, he's from America. He and I were debating Bashir Vania and Muhammad Kuvadia. And I said to them, the subject of the debate was the Christology of Jesus in the Quran and the Bible. So I said to them, I said, you know, listen, I said, I'm telling you all these unique things about Jesus. I said, why don't you Muslims forget about Christianity? Why don't you do just an open, objective study of what the Quran says positively about Jesus? These points. And when you finished, form a Muslim Christology so that we can know why he was born of a virgin, why he went to heaven, you know, why he's called the Messiah and all that. And I looked at them and they didn't say a word. And I said to them, I said, you know why you won't do it? I said, because you'll end up with a Christian Jesus. <laughs> anyway, this book is... Um, I treasure this book just because of its contents. I've shown also how all the Muslim errors of belief about Jesus were derived from heretical sources before the time of Islam. The Gnostics, especially the Gnostics, but also the Marcionites and others. The Quranic Jesus is a mix, mix up of talk of, of, of true stuff about Jesus and then a whole lot of you know, heretical nonsense. And this book to me is an important one. Thirdly, I've got two books I wrote many years ago, and these are just to enlighten Christians, Muhammad and the Prophet of Islam, and this is the Quran, the scripture of Islam. In these two books, I'm covering uh, what Christians need to know about Muhammad and what they need to know about the Quran. So these are not books just generally discussing these subjects. They are focusing on what we need to know. And then the two, probably the more important books that I've written, Sharing the Gospel with Muslims. In this, after all the years that we've done outreach with Muslims, I just put down how to use the Quran as well as the Bible on every aspect. I've gone from Adam right down to Jesus himself, gone through the whole Bible. This book is very popular overseas. Like Andreas has been translated to another number of different languages, freely available on the internet. It's a popular book. And then this is probably my most popular book. It's in many different languages, uh, facing the Muslim challenge. And this is handling Muslim objections to Christianity, which we picked up in discussion with them over all the years. And all the major ones, because they keep coming up with the same ones all the time. So all the major ones are covered in this book. Now, these are 50 rand each. We've reduced the price of these because I want Christian people to, to read and learn. You're not going to learn that much hearing us today. You hear and you walk away. This is where you learn, is when you read and you study. So we've reduced these to 50 rand each. And if you want to buy all six, you can have it for 200. So you're getting two of them free. 200 rand will buy you all six. And then just the others I've got. Our approach to Muslims, that's just what our Christian attitude should be towards Muslims. Do we have a militant attitude to them or do we have a, a loving, compassionate attitude? This booklet covers all that. That's 50 rand. That. And then I've got my debate with Shabir Ali that I had in Benoni in 2009, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And then two books I've written that are not re directly relevant to Muslim evangelism, but to me are in the field of Christian apologetics where I am today. This one, Jesus Disfigured, Exposing the Gnostic Gospel. This is a, quite a long book, but it's not heavy reading because there's a lot of ground covered here. And it covers the Gospel of Judas. I'm sure you've heard of these. The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Philip, the Apocryphon of John. All these apocryphal Gospels and things that came up that caused the Da Vinci Code and all that other stuff. Stories about Jesus being married to Mary Magdalene comes out of the Gospel of Philip and so on. All that's a lot of nonsense. This is, I've made this the most comprehensive book I possibly could. It's 200 rand a copy. And then my last one is a book called Designed for a Purpose. This is a book, first half of it's on science and evolution. But this book does what very few books do, even scientific books. It starts at the beginning and it goes right through to the end. It starts at the Big Bang right at the beginning and finishes with the next Big Bang, which would be the day Jesus returns to Earth. So, <laughs> so I've covered everything from the beginning to the end and right through the book. It's a book I enjoyed writing many years ago. This goes for 150. And then lastly, uh, Andreas mentioned my booklet, Knowing God Personally. Um, I've got a number of spare copies, so I brought about 50 of them there. Any of you welcome to take one of these free. If you are going to give, if you've got Muslims, you can give the booklet to you. Welcome to clean them out there. I don't mind because I've got stocks at home as well. But please feel free to take a number of them. And then if you can, even if you find it hard to witness to Muslims, just at least give them a booklet like I do to, even in my business, I always say, just read it. And it means so much. Folk, thank you very much.